Hello, everyone. I'm Andrew McKenzie. I'm a lawyer here at Beresford Booth and have been practicing civil litigation for over 17 years. Today, we're going to be talking about a very uh, important and interesting topic in civil litigation. Summary judgment, can you win your case without trial? Um, so um, hopefully, most of you have not had to be involved in litigation. But uh, if you do, it's important to understand the process. When you get sued or if you have to sue someone, uh, it can be daunting to have to deal with the court system. And people will oftentimes wonder, uh, am I going to have to actually go through the point of completing a trial? Um, how long will that take? How much is it going to cost me? What is going to be involved? And uh, I can't answer that question, obviously, since I'm speaking only in general terms. Every case is different. Um, but uh, there is a, a typical process of litigation um, that I've sort of outlined in very general terms here in this slide. I call it main sequence, main litigation sequence because um, I'm drawing an analogy to the world of astronomy. I've been into astronomy for most of my life. And um, the typical star in the universe goes through a life cycle. Um, and this uh, analogy assumes that we are not going to have everything terminate prematurely via a settlement, which is very common and, in, and is in fact the norm. But as we're marching through trial or towards trial, we have several stages. The first stage uh, here is a complaint or complaints where the plaintiff is asserting claims. They file those with the court and they get those served on the defendant party or parties. The next stage is an answer um, where the defending parties uh, state what they agree with and do not agree with in the factual claims being made. They also assert affirmative defenses, and in some cases, they will assert counterclaims. The next stage is the uh, typically the lengthiest of all of the stages in litigation, and that's the discovery stage, where parties are gathering evidence and developing their case and their theories to prepare for the trial. That discovery stage uh, will typically take the form of written discovery requests propounded to the opposing party. It will take the form of subpoenas uh, propounded to third parties. And it will also sometimes take the form of depositions that can involve your deposition being taken third parties' depositions getting taken, and the opposing parties' deposition being taken. And then eventually, if the case has not settled, it, there will be a trial. There can be a trial by a judge or a trial by a jury. Um, sometimes it's both. Uh, factual matters will normally be decided by a jury if there's a jury trial. Strictly legal matters will be uh, decided by a judge. Um, and um, after the trial, there will oftentimes be one party, usually the losing party, who is contesting the judgment that was entered, and they may appeal that judgment, claiming that the trial court erred in one way or another. So um, occasionally, however, um, just like stars in the universe can uh, go a different route than the main sequence stars. They could, there can be a uh, supernova or uh, a, a star might, might just uh, be too small to really burn fuel, sort of like a party running out of resources and not being able to continue litigating. Um, but the, the supernova analogy is sort of like when there's a summary judgment or some other event that prematurely terminates the litigation and results in some kind of resolution or judgment. Um, so um, this next slide is a tribute to uh, Star Trek The Next Generation fans. 
which I happen to be one of them. This was from one of the earliest episodes of Star Trek The Next Generation, uh, showing the character Q over there in the crazy hat, um, conducting a trial or a sham trial, uh, acting like a judge. And there's, of course, John Luke Picard there on the left, who uh, uh, is part of the team of human defendants in the trial. Um, and uh, what, what summary judgment really does is it dispenses with the need for a trial. And this slide sort of represents that because a fake trial is almost like no trial at all. Um, so summary judgment is getting a judgment from the court based upon what the undisputed facts are that are presented to the court. When I say undisputed, that's important because if there is a material fact where you have differing accounts of what happened, the judge normally is not able to resolve that dispute at the stage of summary judgment. That is an issue that normally has to go to trial. So what you're looking for in a summary judgment situation is you're asking yourself what facts are actually disputed. If there are things that are not in dispute, does that mean that one party will, as a matter of law, win? So summary judgment is available when the party having the burden of proof cannot establish an essential element of proof of the claim or defense. So that can be either a plaintiff or a defendant. It is not necessarily one or the other that is going to be bringing this motion. Um, it can be based upon an issue of law, meaning if the facts are um, a particular way, the parties might disagree over what the law should be in light of those facts. And in that situation, if the parties agree what the facts are, but just don't agree with what the uh, legal consequences should be in light of those facts, that is, that is a situation where a court can rule uh, on what the law is and issue summary judgment for one party or another. One thing about summary judgment, the word summary refers to um, sort of being able to expedite the resolution and dispense with the need to go through the rigors of sorting out the party's credibility. So it's sort of like you're skipping over the details and you're just getting to the summary result. Um, the party that is bringing the motion for summary judgment and asking the court to rule without the need for a trial bears the burden to demonstrate the absence of a genuine issue of material fact and entitlement to judgment as a matter of law. So if I bring the motion, I have to show that there is no uh, material disputed fact. The court is generally not going to be weighing credibility. So let's say I've got a dispute with Joe and Joe says the light was green. I say the light was red and there was a crash at the intersection that is the basis of the lawsuit. Um, unless the court has some kind of objective proof about whether the light was green or whether the light was red, the court is generally not going to weigh in on whether I'm telling the truth or whether Joe is telling the truth. If, if there is a situation, however, where one of us has previously admitted that the other side's account is true, there could be a situation where, where the judge would take that into account and discount a, um, uh, a later testimony. Uh, so next I'm going to go on to what I call my banana peel hypothetical. This is for the sake of illustrating how a motion for summary judgment could actually play out in practical terms so that you can understand how it would work. Suppose I walk into Joe's store and, um, and I injure myself and I file a lawsuit against Joe, the owner of the store, and I claim 
that I slipped on a banana peel and I hurt my back. Well, the way that this would normally go uh, in going back to our, our main sequence litigation chart is this would start by me actually preparing and filing a complaint in court. I would serve it on Joe and then it would be Joe's job to file an answer to that complaint. Once that answer has been filed, it is now potentially ripe for either party to file a motion for summary judgment. But keep in mind what those standards are. The moving party has the burden of showing that there is no genuine material fact that's disputed that needs to be resolved at trial. So um, uh, let's suppose that Joe, the defending party, wanted to bring that motion and show the court that, look, under no circumstances can Andrew win at trial. Well, Joe uh, would normally want to gather some evidence in order to show what Joe's version of the story is. Joe would probably want to take my deposition and find out what my testimony is. Suppose that Joe takes my deposition and asks me, so Andrew, you walked into the store and are you claiming that you slipped on a banana peel that was on the floor? Now, suppose in my testimony, I tell Joe, well, I really am not sure what I slipped on. I think I slipped on something. I just remember waking up and I was on my back afterwards. I looked around me. I didn't see anything around me. I didn't see a banana peel. Now, right there, if, that, if I gave testimony to that effect, um, that, would, that would tend to give credence to Joe's position, that if, if we go to trial and I'm not able to testify that I actually slipped on anything that was left on the floor by the store, um, then it's likely going to be impossible for me to demonstrate that the store uh, is liable to me. So what Joe would do is, in light of that testimony, unless there were some other witnesses who saw the banana peel that I claim existed there, uh, Joe would file a motion and probably cite my deposition testimony when I answered those questions. And, um, and if I could not testify that the banana peel was there or that there was anything there that I slipped on that was left by the store, the the uh, the burden would now fall to me. How do I demonstrate that I'm entitled to a trial on this issue? The court is going to look at this motion and be asking itself, what is the disputed material fact that liability turns on that I'm going to need to decide at trial or that the jury would need to decide at trial? Doesn't look like there's anything here. Andrew's claiming negligence and is suing the, the store, claiming liability, but he, it doesn't look like he's actually got anything from which a judge or a jury at trial could conclude uh, makes the store liable for Andrew's claimed injuries. So if I cannot demonstrate um, a breach of a duty, by the store, a breach of a duty is one of the essential elements of my negligence claim, then the store would be entitled to summary judgment. And the court would dispose of the case right then and there by issuing a judgment in favor of the, of the defending store and against me as the plaintiff. So if, if the store would do that, what they've just done is they've dispensed with the need for a trial at all. The litigation is over, except for that I potentially have the right to appeal that uh, order of summary judgment, okay? So that is my banana peel hypothetical to illustrate how that principle works. Um, and, and it's important to educate clients about how this works because we as humans, we all have our own biases. We think to ourselves, 
well, we remember something happening a certain way. Therefore, if the judge would just understand that what I'm telling them is true, really, there shouldn't be a need for a trial and I ought to just win. But remember, the critical principle that I explained earlier, the judge is not going to be weighing credibility of the parties. So if I have one account and the opposing party has a different account, even if they are lying, that is not for the court to decide on a summary judgment motion. The court will be stuck, the parties will be stuck with having a trial to figure out who is telling the truth and who is not. So uh, in, this, in this next slide, uh, I'm illustrating just in bullet point fashion what some of the other purposes can be for summary judgment. Even if you don't actually prevail on your motion, there can be other benefits. One is, uh, that it can flesh out what the other side's evidence is and what their legal position is. Oftentimes, complaints and answers to complaints uh, leave the opposing party in the dark as to what their opponent is actually claiming. When you file a motion for summary judgment and you are trying to flesh out whether the other side actually has anything at all, that will oftentimes prompt the type of questions in the discovery process that force a party resisting a motion for summary judgment to come up with and turn over the cards in their hand to reveal what their evidence is and what their legal theories are. That can also help pr prepare you for trial so that you are not blindsided by a theory advanced or a story or evidence offered at trial by the other side. When you go into trial, you want to be as prepared as possible and avoid, if possible, surprise evidence that the other side might offer. Filing motion for summary judgment uh, can oftentimes also prompt settlement discussions and motivate the other side to settle with you because they see that um, there is a chance that a court might rule in your favor on summary judgment and their case would be over. So rather than take the risk of rolling the dice and seeing whether the court agrees with the opponent's legal position, they might begin to uh, get into settlement discussions with you. And um, uh, that could be a huge benefit. As I said earlier, most cases actually terminate via a settlement and not via a trial or even a motion for summary judgment. Another benefit that filing a motion for summary judgment can have for you is educating the court and educating the other side what your legal position is. Um, uh, pleadings alone uh, will oftentimes not prompt the dialogue that needs to happen between the parties for them to fully understand and appreciate what the opposing side's evidence is and what their legal theories are. It is that, it is that um, battle over summary judgment that will oftentimes get the other party to finally understand why you believe you will win. And it can get them to take that more seriously than they did at the beginning of the case. Another thing to keep in mind is that even if you do not fully win a motion for summary judgment, it can have the benefit of resulting in a, an order granting partial summary judgment. So even if you do not completely win your case, the court has the ability to decide certain legal issues that do not result in a complete resolution. So for example, in the uh, banana peel in the store injury analogy, the court could theoretically decide that the store is definitely liable for the uh, banana peel left on the store and not cleaned up for a full 24 hours. But the court might still reserve for trial the issue of deciding what amount of damages the plaintiff is entitled to. So when you go to a trial in that hypothetical, you don't have to worry about showing that the 
that the defendant is at fault at all, because that issue has been decided on summary judgment. But you still might have a fight over what your damages are. There might be a dispute, for example, over a pre-existing injury or a dispute over what legitimate medical expenses were or a dispute over what pain and suffering was after the injury was incurred. So, um, but not having to worry about the underlying issue of liability because that got knocked out on summary judgment can streamline the trial and reduce the amount of time and resources that you or your lawyer has to put into preparing for trial and it will shorten uh, the trial's duration and save you emotional energy and resources. So um, uh, I hope that this has been beneficial for you. Uh, you should consider when you're in litigation uh, raising the issue with your counsel about whether summary judgment could be an option uh, and discuss that and see if it is an option, what kind of evidence will you likely need to gather in order to bring that motion? And will the cost of bringing that motion be worth the chances of potentially exceeding or succeeding on it and cutting off the need for a trial? So thank you very much for participating and uh, we look forward to uh, serving your needs in the future. Thanks.